Uh, my name is Harry Tormey, and today I'm going to be giving a talk entitled Strategies for Using React Native in a Brownfield Application. The agenda for my talk is like this. Um, I'm going to start out giving you some background information. I'm going to explain terminology that I'll be using, such as what a Greenfield React Native application is and how it's different from a Brownfield React Native application. Then I'm going to move on to section two, which is entitled Should I Do This? Now in this section, I talk about why Brownfield React Native uh, development is particularly challenging. And I give you some heuristics that you can use to decide whether React, Brownfield React Native development is a good fit for you or your organization. I then go on to propose a strategy that I think you should use if you want to try experimenting with Brownfield React Native development. Um, section three is entitled, How Do I Do This? So if you do decide that React Native, uh, Brownfield React Native is a good fit for you, how do you go about implementing it? In this section, uh, I show you an example uh, Brownfield React Native application that I've open sourced uh, that was based on some work that I did for a client. I talk you through the architecture and the process that I used to develop this application so you can take this uh, process and architecture and apply it to your own uh, Brownfield React Native integrations. So what is a Greenfield React Native app? A Greenfield React Native app is an app created from scratch using React Native. What is a Brownfield React Native app? Brownfield React Native app is when you use React Native to power one or more views or user flows within an existing native application. Should I do this? Should you attempt to integrate React Native into an existing iOS application or Android application? Well, before I try to answer this question, let's take a step back and ask ourselves, what is the point of React Native? Now imagine that you were trying to explain this not to a software engineer, but to a layperson. There are many ways that you could do this, but I think a fair way would be to say that React Native allows you to do more with less. If you were to sit down with this person and you were to write out from first principles the high-level pros of React Native, you might say the following. Uh, in theory, React Native allows you to have one engineer uh, work on both your web and your mobile product. React Native allows you to make cross-platform apps. From one TypeScript, JavaScript, or Flow code base, you can have an iOS and Android app that works roughly the same. React Native also allows you to have a faster development cycle. Unlike native, you don't have to wait for your application to compile to see the changes that you've made. In theory, React Native allows your front-end engineers to be roughly two to three times as productive. So why is brownfield uh, development harder than greenfield development? Well, let's think about the things that you would need to know if you were trying to do a Greenfield React Native app on your own. You'd want to know JavaScript, how React works, and how to use React Native. Now, let's think about if you were trying to do a Brownfield integration on your own without any help from anyone else, what would you need to know? Well, you'd need to know JavaScript. You'd need to know how React works. You'd need to know how to use React Native. But you'd also need to know a few other things you'd need to probably know at least one native language. So if you were doing this in an iOS app, that would be probably Swift or Objective-C. If you're doing this for Android, that would be Java or Kotlin. But it's not just enough to know the language that the application is written in. You also have to know how that native platform APIs work. So for example, if you were doing this for an iOS application, you'd probably want to have some idea of how a view controller works and what it's used for. On Android, that would be activities or fragments. But you'd also need to know about that platform's ecosystem and tool chain. So for example, if you want to install a third-party library with a React Native app, you use Yarn or NPM. Uh, for native iOS, uh, you have CocoaPods, Carthage, and a few other options that you can use to install uh, third-party libraries. When you install a third-party library, it has consequences for your native app, both in terms of the binary size and of the way it gets compiled. You need to know about all of that. You also need to know uh, how the existing native code base is architected. But it doesn't stop there. Now, I've been doing software engineering for about 10 years. I started out doing desktop apps, and then I moved to native iOS, then to native Android, then back to native iOS. And today, I do React Native. And as a rule of thumb, I would say it takes me about one to three months to learn a new platform well. Well, if you're doing a brownfield integration, you potentially have two new platforms that you need to learn. Uh, you know, when you switch to a new job, uh, it takes you a while to get your bearings in a code base, right? Uh, you potentially have two new, completely different code bases, uh, one written in Swift, one written in Kotlin, or Objective-C in Java. Uh, those have different patterns and different things that you need to learn. 
So initially, a brownfield integration is probably going to be at least two to three times as hard as a greenfield app. In other words, a brownfield integration potentially nullifies many of the advantages of React Native. So why would you do a brownfield integration? Well, there are many ways to look at technology, but from the point of view of a business, I think one way that you can look at tools like React Native is via return on investment. So we're all software engineers. Uh, our investment is the time that it takes us to learn the tool that we're planning on using. The return is what that tool enables us to do that you couldn't do before. A positive ROI should, in the long run, either save time or increase the pace of development for you or the organization that you're part of. For an individual who doesn't know React Native already, and I stress that part, using React Native in an existing native app is probably a bad investment. So who would a brownfield integration be a good investment for? Organizations. So as the number of engineers working on any app grows, an investment in infrastructure is usually required to maintain the pace of development. Examples of infrastructure investments that organizations might make are as follows. Optimizing build times. Uh, applying continuous integration. Applying linters. You know, changing your data store or using GraphQL. Something like Apollo, which Peggy was talking about, would be pretty awesome in a larger organization. React Native is just another piece of infrastructure that you can view through the lens of return on investment. So which organization should try a brownfield integration? Well, I would say using React Native in a brownfield app is probably best suited for larger organizations. For the reasons that I outlined in the slides before, uh, React Native is an expensive piece of infrastructure to integrate into an existing native code base. Ideally, organizations uh, that have multiple teams working on the same app for multiple platforms. Ideally, an organization that already has a web team that uses and is familiar with React. React Native, in theory, and I stress in theory, can help those organizations I just described be more efficient. The cost of learning can be paralyzed by having multiple people work on a project at once. So if you imagine how you would go about doing a React Native integration, you'd have your native iOS and Android engineers do the initial build out uh, in such a way that subsequent engineers coming from, for example, the web team, don't need to know the specifics of how the uh, iOS platform works or the Android platform works. They can just focus on doing business logic and display in React Native and being very productive. However, adopting any new piece of infrastructure can result in failure if you choose the wrong project. This isn't just a Brownfield React Native integration thing. So let's think about a scenario for a second. Let's say you're a native iOS developer and you're on a tight deadline for a product feature and a week before you have to ship your app, you say, hey, you know, I've been reading Hacker News. This Realm thing is a really cool new database. I'm going to get rid of core data and switch over to Realm. Uh, you know, that's a very risky, invasive thing to do and it might make you uh, slip your schedule. And if that happens, people will be annoyed within your organization at Realm and at you. But that's not to say that Realm isn't a good uh, database solution. You just picked the wrong project and you timed it wrong. So, it's very important to choose the right project at the right time for your organization. This begs the question, how do you pick the right project for a Brownfield integration? Now, I have been doing consulting and contracting for um, a number of years, and I've been working with companies doing uh, Brownfield React Native integrations. And a lot has been written about Brownfield React Native recently. But one article in particular that resonated with my experiences as a consultant that helps companies do Brownfield React Native is one written by the co-founder of Expo, Mr. Charlie Cheever, entitled, Should We Use React Native? Or should you use, yeah, should we use React Native, sorry. So here's what Charlie has to say, and I think this is really solid advice for people getting started and who are just experimenting with Brownfield React Native. He says the following. If you're thinking of using React Native for a few things like a setting screen, an FAQ, or something like an about page, the kind of thing where you just stick in a web view, you're likely to have good luck. Now, Car Charlie doesn't just stop there, though. Uh, he goes on to issue a warning. Now, before I show the warning that he issued, I just want to say something. So I spoke at Chain React last year, and I've been at a number of React Native events, both as a speaker and as an attendee. And when you talk to people at these events, most of the people um, are web engineers who are coming to mobile, and React Native is their first foray into mobile. So a lot of those people may not be aware of the history of JavaScript and mobile. 
So a lot of people um, who are iOS and Android engineers have negative experiences with JavaScript in the past. They might have an outdated view of it and think uh, of JavaScript as being synonymous with jQuery and like hybrid web apps that didn't feel very nice. So Charlie says the following. There are people who identify themselves strongly as native iOS or Android programmers and have a really hard time being happy with React Native. iOS programmers in particular are very unhappy with it and generally regard JS as an infestation of the company's code base. It's true, you know? So for example, I would have been one of those engineers uh, a few years ago because I've been doing like mobile development since 2008. And if you go back in time, uh, you know, like Yahoo, all of these companies were all doing hybrid uh, mobile apps. And at the time, I hated working with them because JavaScript back in 2008 was like jQuery and like, you know, it was web views and mobile browsers were very slow and stuff like that. So if you're going into an organization and you're trying to pitch React Native, you have to be mindful that like the engineers who've been working on mobile for a long time might not have the current view that you have, which is that, hey, in the last few years, Babel and transpilers are a thing, TypeScript is a thing, or oh, there's all sorts of cool stuff going on with Reason, there's all of this tool chain that makes it totally different. They don't know how React works, and so they might have a negative perception of you. But luckily for you, I gave a talk, because I consider myself an iOS engineer first and a React Native engineer second, at an iOS developer conference called UIConf. And uh, the title of the talk is an iOS developer's take on React Native. In this talk, I explain how React Native works, how it's different from hybrid uh, web apps, and how a lot of things have changed, both in terms of the frameworks, like React, and, thing, and transpilers and other stuff that makes JavaScript uh, awesome. So this talk is geared towards native developers, and you might want to check it out if you're trying to explain to people why React Native is not an absolutely terrible idea. So Charlie also goes on to say the following thing, which I agree with. Even if you're using React Native for things that it's good at and having success, it can still be hard for large-scale native and React Native development to exist in the same organization for non-technical reasons. So again, you know, as I just made the case, this is a technology that's probably best suited for larger organizations. In larger organizations, you have to deal with the relationship with different, different teams. So if you want infrastructure to be widely adopted in an organization, it's important to build trust in both you and the infrastructure that you're trying to get the organization to adopt. This isn't just a React Native thing. This also appears, uh, uh, applies to databases and other types of technology that you might want other people to use. So I endorse the Charlie Cheever approach. Start small and build momentum on your success. Ideally, your first brownfield project should be something simple and quantifiable. Uh, you know, a lot of native engineers will see the word JavaScript and think, oh, this is going to be really slow and buggy. If you start out with a small screen, a promotional dialogue, an about thing, a settings screen, or whatever, you can put those fears to rest, or at least mitigate some of them and build momentum. Okay, so I've given you some food to thought, uh, for thought. Uh, you know, but now you've decided you actually want to try this out. So how do I do this? Well, I'm going to show you an example app, and this example app that I've written was actually based on some work that I did for a San Francisco-based startup called KeepSafe. KeepSafe, uh, basically, they sell a suite of privacy uh, tools, and they have a freemium business model, and they get you to upgrade to a subscription for more features. So what KeepSafe wanted to do was they wanted to basically power uh, the dialogue that converts you from a free to a premium subscriber uh, with React Native so that they could iterate on their A-B tests faster. So they wanted to be able to use code push to ship new experiments without submitting a new app to the App Store. So let's look at this example. You can find the source code for this example up on my GitHub here. And what we're going to do is uh, the white screen that you see is the native part of the app. The uh, blue and purple screens, which match the um, chain React color scheme, uh, are powered by React Native. And this is going to simulate this flow. So let's uh, play this demo. So what does this example need to do, irregardless of if we were using React Native or not? Well, uh, we need to display a particular upsell experiment when a user does something in the native app. That something might be tapping a button or an icon, or it could be when the user's account is in a certain state and they use the application at a certain time. We also need uh, to get a list of the available experiment screens at runtime. So when the application starts up, we need a way to say, 
hey, what screens have you got into so that the A-B testing system can know which ones we can show you in this particular version of the app. So what parts of this demo are React Native powered? So as I said before, uh, the white screen is all native and the colored screens are React Native. And this is kind of a rough diagram showing the flow between the two components. So what does our React Native integration need to be able to do? Well, fundamentally, we need a way to send and receive events between React Native and the native application that you're integrating into. We also need a way to pass data in and out of React Native. So how do we do this? Well, luckily for me, uh, some very smart engineers from Pinterest were doing some brownfield integration work, and they came up with a solution called React Native Event Bridge, which makes it easier to bridge uh, React Native in the context of a brownfield application. You can find it up here on their GitHub. It's a really good package. Uh, they're actually here today um, at Chain React. Uh, Torben might be a little bit easier to find than Michael. Uh, Michael doesn't, in fact, look like a disembodied Starbucks cup, but they're both awesome people. You should talk to them about uh, Brownfield React Native at Pinterest. So, okay, so let's talk through this from the point of view of uh, you clicking that purchase button. What's actually going on? So when I click purchase, uh, React Native is going to emit an event in JavaScript with an SKU. An SKU, for those of you who haven't worked in commerce, is just a unique identifier that maps back to an item. In this case, it would probably be put into Apple Pay, but it could be something that would be you know, a Shopify ID or something else. Events are just strings that are defined both in JavaScript and in native. Native code has event handlers that hook into the existing payment system. So there's basically a handler, a callback function, that's waiting for a string to come across the bridge with an optional payload, and it's going to do something when that occurs. So let's go look at this example again and enumerate the events that are going to be coming back from React Native. So we kick off the React Native screen, we tap the close item, that's a dismiss event. We click the purchase button, and that dialog that's coming up there, that's meant to represent a uh, you know, Apple Pay event. So that's also going to be an event that's going across the bridge. So what happens? So when the application starts up, when we're displaying that white screen, uh, before any React Native is on the screen, we get a list from React Native of all the screens and we build basically uh, them into our A-B testing framework so it knows what you can display. When you dismiss a screen, we need to tell the uh, native navigation system to uh, dismiss the screen that's in front of the user. When we make purchase, we need to hook into Apple Pay or whatever we're using on the native side, and we need to handle that purchase event. So uh, on iOS, uh, every screen roughly maps to at least one view controller. A view controller, loosely speaking, is kind of analogous to a React component. So there is a native view controller that's hosting the screen that's displaying the uh, React Native UI, which is the purple and blue stuff up there. Uh, this native view controller is responsible for processing the events that are coming back from uh, JavaScript. And React Native is responsible for basically the business logic, display logic, and it also, in a more built-out example, would have CodePush integrated. And when CodePush receives a new set of screens, it would send basically that event over the bridge, and the native code would update the manifest of screens in the application. So what does this look like in code? Well, uh, we would define a bunch of uh, strings to represent events roughly like this. Your, uh, component would look like a normal uh, React Native component. But let's just zoom in to the purchase function. What is actually going on there? So this is using React Native Event Bridge to emit an event that's going to be caught on the native side of the bridge. And this event that we're emitting is just a string like I showed you before, and we're passing with that a dictionary that contains the SKU. So what does this look like on the other side of the bridge, in the native side? Well, we have uh, some constants that are like correspond to the events like dismiss screen, purchase item, list screens. We also have a view controller. Again, remember a view controller is roughly analogous to a React component, but this is the thing that when you actually click that purchase item button, gets instantiated. And in this, it has a bunch of code that like basically set up 
uh, callback handlers uh, to handle the events as they're coming across the bridge. So let's zoom in on one of those. So in this particular example in Swift, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, when we get a purchase item event, call this function. And in this particular example, I'm obviously not hooking it up to a real uh, purchasing system. I'm just displaying a UI alert dialog, right? Okay, let's zoom out and see, uh, you know, in totality, all the JavaScript code that went into powering this application. So what does the entry point for this look like in JavaScript? Well, uh, you know, just like a, a normal React Native app that you would create, it has a, a place where you register your module, and it has a render function, component did mount, uh, component will unmount. Uh, in the render function, though, I call a function called getScreen. And with this getScreen function, I'm passing in the props uh, that came through initially with React Native. So this getScreen function basically is just a big series of if statements that checks to see if the screen key in the props that you passed in uh, corresponds to a component that this bundle is aware of. And it returns that, and that will be what gets rendered with the props that you passed in. Below there is um, a screen list function. This is the thing that actually gets sent back to native when uh, the application starts up. So the native application will start up and just say, hey, React Native, uh, what like screens are in there? And I return basically a list of all of these screens uh, with configuration files associated with them. Those configuration files, which I'm going to show you in just a moment, will be turned into props and passed through when you instantiate uh, the React Native thing that's being displayed. Again, this is just the const strings that we're using in our um, React Native uh, application. The upsell screen, I showed you this before, it looks exactly kind of like a normal React Native component. It just uses the React Native event bridge to emit events. So what about this configuration screen? Why do I do this? So this is the default properties that I want to use to drive my um, you know, uh, screen that I'm displaying to you. One thing that we do include here is the SKU and the price. The reason why we do this is you might want to actually localize the price to different countries. And you would do this probably using the existing Apple Pay infrastructure, or at least that was what my client did. So what would happen is, by default, it would pass down this SKU and config, but it might change the price depending on the locale it is, and you do that in native code. So what happens when React Native displays a screen? So again, as I was saying, um, every screen in iOS has at least one view controller in it. And React Native view controller uh, .swift is the thing that hosts React Native. And so when that gets instantiated, it basically passes down some props, which are based in the config.js file that I just showed you. Index.js gets called when the screen as, uh, is shown, and it basically figures out, based on these props, which screen to actually display. In the props, there's going to be a screen key that you will set. So you can use the same uh, React Native view controller that's Swift to power multiple React Native screens. Uh, if it doesn't find the screen, I also include a screen not found dialog, but that should, of course, never ever happen. Native code has event handlers in it. Those event handlers live in this example in React Native view controller. And whenever an event like dismissing a screen or talking to Apple Pay occurs from React Native, uh, basically a callback gets called in those um, code. So let's have a look at like, what this looks like in native code. So if you're not familiar with um, uh, iOS development, uh, an app delegate is basically the entry point into uh, your uh, iOS application. It is the first thing that gets called. And the lifecycle functions that are in there uh, correspond to different events that pertain to all of the different view controllers in your app. So basically what we're doing here is we're basically uh, talking to the React Native view controller and we're saying, hey, the application did launch, so basically fetch all of the screens out of React Native and warm up the bridge for me. React Native view controller that's Swift, uh, I showed you that earlier. Um, basically what this does is it handles processing all of the events that get sent back from JavaScript. Uh, React Native uh, event, uh, this is some Objective-C code that I wrote. Uh, to handle uh, an event, and it's basically just a string and a callback uh, function, which is the handler in this example. React Native uh, Host Controller is the parent class of React Native View Controller that's Swift. It just basically defines the uh, interface that you're going to use for basically adding, removing events, or um, you know, uh, telling the uh, React Native that the application did uh, launch. It also has a way for you to insert data into uh, a React Native view after you've displayed it, right? React Native constants, this is just basically the strings that I'm using um, in the native side of the code base. 
And this little thing, React Native uh, Screen Manager, this is the singleton uh, where all of the screens get put into, and it's meant to simulate an A-B testing framework. So basically, when I click that button, I'm gonna call into this and say, hey, uh, give me a random screen and a set of props to display at runtime. Okay, so that's the architecture, but how would you actually apply this if you were going to do a Brownfield uh, React Native integration? Well, let's talk through a scenario. Imagine that I'm working with uh, Michael and Torben at Pinterest on a new product. And imagine that uh, I don't have all of the uh, native iOS knowledge or Android knowledge, and I'm just a humble React Native engineer. Uh, but Torben is an expert Android uh, engineer, and Michael is an expert iOS engineer. How are we going to ship a new product feature? Well, the first thing that we do is we'd probably get together and we'd look over the mocks that have been uh, designed uh, by our designer. And we would just ask ourselves, hey, do we need to do any native work to support this new uh, feature? And if the answer is yes, uh, then Torben and Michael spring into action and I stub out some events and continue on implementing my uh, JavaScript or TypeScript or Flow React Native uh, UI. We then basically um, converge with our PM and we basically look over the mocks and we test it out. If something is broken on Android in the native side, Torben will fix it. If something's broken on iOS, uh, Michael will fix it. If my UI looks a bit whack, uh, I'll go make that awesome. Uh, but when, we're, when the designer PM and our testing process is happy, we then move on to the next stage. We basically can't do uh, over-the-air updates for native code. So if we had to implement any new native features, uh, we basically just package up our bundle, put it into the app, and we wait for the next release cycle for that to go into the app store. If we want to do an over-the-air update and we haven't done any uh, native changes and the PM or designer is happy, we're good to go, we'll just push it out immediately and turn on the test for those users. So, you know, I'm not the only person who's done speaking or has written about uh, Brownfield React Native. There's a bunch of awesome people who've done really great work, and I think uh, one of the most famous of them is Artsy. Artsy have a Brownfield React Native uh, application. And if you're thinking about doing uh, Brownfield React Native, uh, their uh, blog is an absolute must read. Uh, you definitely should check it out. They've also open sourced their application and they've open sourced a component library uh, that's really, really good and it's worth checking out. Uh, one of the main contributors at uh, Artsy who does a lot of work on CocoaPods, Danger, and uh, Brownfield React Native is Ortha. Ortha is an absolutely awesome guy. He makes a great cup of tea. You should follow him on Twitter. Uh, totally uh, great guy. I believe they are hiring as well, so shout out to Artsy. And um, Pinterest are experimenting with Brownfield React Native. Um, so Vivian Q wrote a really great blog post about this. I believe that Vivian is here today at Chain React. Uh, Torben, who I mentioned earlier, gave a more um, Android-specific presentation on Brownfield React Native at DroidCon Berlin, a really awesome um, Android developer uh, conference entitled uh, Leverage Your Android Knowledge to Boost Your Team's Velocity with React Native. Uh, you can follow both Torben and Michael on um, Twitter. They're two awesome guys. They're here today, so have a chat with them. I would also just like to add that uh, I do uh, React Native consulting, contracting, and training. And I actually have been doing Brownfield training and specifically. So if you're interested in hiring me or you need any help with your projects, shoot me an email at harry.n.gale at gmail.com. You can follow me at Twitter at htormy, and uh, I will be publishing these slides to my Medium blog, which you can find at launchdoor.com. Uh, I just want to finish off by saying thank you so much to Michael and Torben and Rob for helping me out with my presentation and for KeepSafe for letting me help them out with their application. And I also want to say thank you to Infinite Red. This conference is absolutely awesome and you all are absolutely awesome for listening to me ramble on. Thank you so much.